Well, I'm about there with this bike and it is turning out to be a beautiful, very well polished, very good condition, 2500 Pro Trek, early 90s model with full DA. And yeah, I just need to string up some cables and let's just make this one beautiful conclusion and call it a wrap after this. Welcome to I Know A Guy Bicycles. Welcome to I Know A Guy Bicycles. Hanging out with the guy. Hi, I'm Justin the guy. Obviously, I have a garage shop. I'm taking scary how to use bikes one bike at a time. If you like these videos, please like and subscribe. Welcome back to Noah Guy Bicycles, hanging out with the guy. Hey, I'm Justin the Guy on this old bike series. We're looking at this early Trek uh, 2500 Pro composite uh, American bicycle technology. That's what it says on the sticker. It's kind of funny. Anyway, um, this particular bike kind of hits heartstrings for me because when I worked at Parker Bikes back in the late 80s, early 90s, this is one of those gems that would go through our shop. Uh, and then back then when Durace and carbon fiber bikes were, I would say, more affordable, um, more tangible in a sense. And they didn't have like 14 different models of it. It was like the when cycling was just kind of really in its infancy of really branching out to big boys. So the Trek Carbon main tubes here were really the, the big thing of the early 90s and 2000s. Um, then the chainstays got added to it. This is kind of a revolutionary type of bike. I'm gonna talk about this as I finish this up. Um, I got the brakes strung up. This does have internal routing for the brake only, but there's external here. I'm just you know make, making this back to fresh. So anywho, um, the the bike on this is i talked about it before in another video is like it's a bonded carbon and trek at this particular time was all they were doing is uh, gluing their frames together and the early uh, 90s to early or actually through the 90s and through um, the early new, uh, 2000s when they came across uh, some overseas manufacturing skills so that's where you see the frames of today and this kind of thing is really popular amongst the specialized and giant and you'll see several of these types of models available um, in that period of time and quite honestly they were very similar <laughs> the techniques were kind of kind of the same um, but Trek was trying to build the majority of their bikes in the United States, so kudos for them for trying. And they did for a good period of time. Um, and then all of a sudden, things just had to change over. And that was in about 2007, 2008. But anywho, this particular bike, well, why it hits heartstrings is my dad, and I think the second year of having a shop, decided to basically reward himself for basically getting the shop open and running. And with that reward, it was essentially, uh, he got himself a 2500 model, this one, but the year before it, um, and the year before it, these are really goofy, but they're internal. Um, the year before it had just the three two carbons and the chainstays were silver, or not silver, well, they were polished aluminum. And uh, I don't know why they took the bolt on the inside for aerodynamics, but that's what they did. Anyway, um, <laughs> kind of goofy. Uh, so, yeah, so it had, I mean, I remember seeing that bike and it was awesome. And it didn't have STI shifters, it had the down tube shifters. And um, when the, uh, the STI shifters came out, he did upgrade to those. And it, I think it was a seven speed. So um, and keep in mind, seven, eight speeds, the spacing of the shifting is the same. So you just basically have an extra click in the shifter. So a little side gold nugget there if you're retrofitting any of these really older bikes. Um, the, uh, so the free hub body is different on that. So when you're looking at the eight, nine, and 10 speeds, the free hub body is the same, but the spacing between the cassettes are different, and that changes what you have to do. So those are not inter interchangeable or compatible for shifters. So that's where you're looking at that. Um, this was, I think, one of the first years that Shimano went to STI, and they started off with Durace, and then it trickled down from there. So that was kind of a cool thing. 
see if I got that tightened up. Use my cable, pull it here, see if I can get a little more tension on this cable. With this awkward bolt angle. So thinking about how far things have changed in the last 30 years, um, and what things have not changed in the last 30 years. So still using a lot of the same materials, right? Um, you know, you're looking at carbon fiber, aluminums, some blends. And eight speed at this time was pretty smoking. Um, Cause that finally got us out of the seven speed dark ages. <laughs> so. I did put a little bit bigger block on the back so the chain is pretty tight. Do a little bit of adjustment on the front. And pretty smooth stuff for being 30 years. It's pretty amazing. That just blows my mind, you know. I mean, it was really in good condition. It was hardly ever used, but the, the shifting on this, um, when they first came out with it, the shifting indexing part was just really tight. Um, it's like a little bit of a movement in the shifter moved up and down. And this attention to detail back then with Durace is crazy. Even the jockey pulleys of the trailer say Durace on it. As a Durace bottom bracket, if you pull the spindle out, it'll say Durace on the spindle itself where nobody sees. This has a Durace headset. Um, the hubs are Durace, but the wheels are built um, from probably from Trek for the Matrix, for these Matrix wheels. Matrix was a house brand for Trek before they changed it to Icon, then they changed Icon to Bontrager when, when that goes. So that's a little bit of history there, right? Um, so yeah, kind of cool stuff. And ironically, the, the one inch threaded quill stem was still in play for another six to eight years after this bike was built. So that made it quite entertaining when they switched over to a headset, which they started those in the mountain bikes. I remember those when those came out, I was kind of like, what is this? You know, newfangled thing. And you got to keep in mind, when we got stuff in the bike shop, we relied a lot of information on reps, and that's where the reps actually became very, they were very beneficial uh, to, you know, telling those, you know, spreading the change, um, what's the new tech that's coming out, the, you know, spreading the new word, because you got to think about it, back then, there was no internet, right? So you were dealing with, you relied on your reps to tell you the, the the information and to teach you what's new and you'd go to bike shows and those were very vital back then because you didn't have the internet you really had to go and do uh, a lot um, to learn and school yourself on the new products and how the you know technological changes in our are happening and when that a headset came out i was kind of like what is this same thing with disc brakes it was kind of very Pretty, pretty rough rollout on disc brakes. Um, is Hayes disc brakes was the first ones I think came out and nobody knew how to work on them. They, you know, they weren't teaching us really. You just read the manuals and the manuals were translated and you're like, eh. you know, you kind of trial by error. I remember having dot three fluid all over me and the floor and the bike, you know, trying to do my first brake bleed. It was a mess. I mean, that was like, I don't know what the hell I was doing. Um, and it was pretty sad because they didn't have those um, educational uh, bits out there that today. You know, something comes out the line, you can watch a YouTube video, <laughs> since we're on YouTube, and be able to get to um, figure that all out. And, you know, I've, YouTube's become a huge friend of mine because when I come across with some weird wackadoodle thing that's like older or whatever, I'm like, I don't know, I haven't really seen this, or I have forgotten about how to do it. I'll find, there's a video of some old kook like me out there going, hey, this is what you need to do about this little thing and we're jigging and try to figure it out. And um, those are very beneficial when you're coming across the really oddball old stuff where 
Um, there weren't manuals. I mean, there was no manuals on this stuff or how to, you know, clean or work the innards of these or why is the, you know, the derailleur, is it missing a spring? On these particular derailleurs, they had like a gap and they had preload springs on the actual pivots. They changed that since then and it's pretty common today to see that big spring that comes across. That was a huge deal because these particular springs would wear out and when they wore out, they were done. I mean, they were, they were pretty much toast. You can't replace those, that kind of deal. So um, that's what we're looking at on that. Well, I need to throw some pedals on this for test riding. But I will think I'll just, when I market this one, it'll just be without pedals. So I think the pedals that may have came with this originally from OEM were probably some like Mavic pedals, something really oddball, first SPD design that nobody rides now. So um, either I'll leave platforms on there or I will give... Uh, See, whoever decides to buy it locally. I mean, I hope the bike does get written, but this is a particular bike that is so pristine. It could go into some, you know, some collector and, or gallery or a museum for sure, because this is one of those bikes that kind of revolutionized or was the next step in road riding. Um, matter of fact, I mean, the carbon was one huge beneficial thing, lightened up the bike. Um, you know, Durace, this is where Durace changed to STI shifting, which was a huge benefit edge when you're racing back then, because when you're about ready to attack, um, they would hear or see you move your wrist down to shift down here. Well, when this STI is shifting, you don't see that, you just hear click, 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 jump, 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 go! And that split second advantage really threw a lot of people off is that's where they're used to people diving down to grab their shifter. So that was one of the things I remember hearing about at the time as a huge beneficial factor. Now we just take it for granted and obviously, you know, Racing is completely a different awareness, but anywho, that was a huge different level up, if you will, in this, the racing of bicycles. That kind of deal. Get some oh, wrapped up. And this is an eight speed, so technically you could always switch it to a nine speed or a 10 speed with the wheel set on there. And it's an older wheel set, so if, you know, if anybody gets this bike, it'd be a good, you know, great bike to ride, uh, but it might be one of those bikes that you start off with, or if you have a collection, you're not riding it all the time and hammer it. Just one of those like, um, I want to show off something fancy, like a classic car, right? You want to show off something fancy and cool on a group ride or something like that? This would be the bomb because it has a huge conversational piece to it. Um, and, you know, if anybody's been around cycling, and they see this and be like, oh, I remember those. And I've already had people post comments on videos that have been related to this bike already going, oh, I have one of those, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Or I had one or I have, I bought a frame and built it up, um, those kinds of things. So it is definitely a fun bike um, and it performs really well. And it's kind of like one of those things where you know, if you get into road riding, it's kind of fun to go back in time and pick up a couple of old classics and build them up really nice. And it's not too terribly expensive to do so and do some of those, you know, fun rides and, you know, compare the 2500 Pro to your ride up to um, Bruce Canyon or locally here or up to Estes or whatever. Um, there's a couple other ones, but, you know, you, you compare that to what the newer ones are and, you know, you'll find it's it's quite different, <laughs> but in a lot of things it's kind of the same. But it'd be kind of you know it's, it's just fun to be able to identify those different different things. And uh, and I, as I've been doing this, it's been a lot of fun because I'm not pigeonholed to a brand. Like when you're in a bike shop, you're stuck with that particular brand, or you feel like you, that's all you should ride. 
Um, and that's where you get the deals. So it's kind of like here. I mean, you're a poor bike mechanic employee from a bike shop, so you don't make a lot of money. So you rely on those discounts quite a bit when you're purchasing a bike for yourself to ride. And you know, then you're then you're kind of stuck with the, either the Trek or the Specialized or the Cannondale or whatever company, you know, companies that you're dealing with. Um, so what I'm trying to say is by doing this, I picked up a lot of different brands that I wasn't at. I wouldn't say I was familiar with them, but I wasn't familiar with them in the state that I worked with them in a day to day. And and taking the opportunity to take, pick up a few of those and go for longer rides um, and getting the feel for the bike, that those that's pretty fun. So, you know, if you're a cat that worked at a bike shop and all you carried was Trek and maybe a brand other or two, and uh, hey, try a couple of those other brands out, you know. Or, you know, even be, even be squirrely and go, I'm going to try out what my competitors was back in the day and try one of their brands out in the same kind of model and see if there was really anything to it, the difference of it. Because, you know, each brand has its own Kool-Aid and they always kind of bash the other brands for, well, they don't do this or whatever, you know. You know? <laughs> Today, it's kind of like, well, geometry specs is about the only difference that, you know, the team machine distinguishes you from the other brand because there's a couple of little nuances of like some cool tech things. But besides that, they're all made in the same place and the materials are very similar. And that's only a third of the bike. So if you really think about it, the other two thirds of the bikes is the componentry and the wheels, which they are cross, uh, crossed over from all these other brands. So it's really about how the ride, uh, the ride of the bike is by the geometry itself. And uh, that's what makes the biggest difference, for sure. So, yeah, um, that's where it led me to do a ride Cannondale's, which I've never ridden before, a Titanium. Um, what else did I ride? Rode uh, a lot more Specialized than before. Uh, Le Mans, even though we carried Le Mans, I never had a Le Mans in the carbon. Um, so yeah, you know, it's those kind of experiences. And even the brands that we did carry, so I was like really in the mountain biking in the 90s. That was my thing, along with everybody else. Um, but and now, since my life has changed the sense where I'm right next to a bike path, road riding is a lot more conducive for me to do. And uh, that's where I found, you know, picking up that road bike, that's what started all this is I was laying there, you know, looking at, you know, Craigslist or Frequency Marketplace. And I was like, wow, that client used to back in the day used to be 2,500, three grand. I can go pick one up for 500 bucks and fix it up and ride and try it out because I didn't get a chance to ride them for a long time in the saddle to try them out just for test rides because that's what I wasn't doing back then. And then now I've been able to try all those different brands out that I didn't get used to as well as the brands I did carry and get to try those out and um, see which ones feel better fit. Was it really, you know, what I remember was the Kool-Aid correct or was it just more marketing hype? Um, all those kinds of things. So it's been kind of fun to do that kind of uh you know, experiment and roll back. Um, and for yourself, if you do get into road riding, uh, that's one of those things like you can have a couple road bikes and be really intrigued on how they feel and how they ride. Um, some people get really stuck on brand, which is fine, uh, but there's a lot of good brands out there. And try some, you know, weird or unique niches out there too. If you want, you know, there's titanium out there that have some individual builders. You can get a custom frame built, um, or you can try some of like the uh, Serata uh, or Salsa. Uh, those are really good bikes out there. It's, it's just, you know, and the different types and different what they're designed for. Um, I've always been intri intrigued about. Uh, adventure riding you know i was like the touring on steroids and you go out on dirt roads and stuff and that's where the gravel bikes pretty much were born out of between that and cycle cross is like oh we have like this great opportunity to make this new model of bike 
that's more diverse, which I've been riding cyclocross since the 90s, and I've always known the benefit. I never raced cyclocross. I just know the benefit of just jumping off road and just uh, able to ride, and you didn't lose too much on a pavement and still had an enjoyable time, that kind of thing. And, you know, go, go figure. It became a huge thing, and that's great. That's, that's great. I mean, gravel's huge, and now disc brakes are incorporated into those road bikes, so now you don't have those tight pinch points like you see here um, to be able to have more wheel space to accommodate wider tires or a variety of tires, which which kind of cool. You can take a Damane or a Roubaix and get two sets of wheels, and one's more of a gravel tire and one's a, a road tire, and that way... You can have the best of both worlds, and it's just swapping wheels real quickly. But, you know, that's a cost. <laughs> Extra wheels, more expensive bikes. But if you're into riding, you'll, you'll eventually work up and gain your, uh, or validate the purse, basically, to spend more money on those bikes. And if there's a will, there's a way, right? Eventually, it'll get there. And you know, I always thought about it, too. It's like, I could never afford a $4,000 bike. But, you know, you think about it. You ride a couple. You buy a couple. Turn around and sell them. And, and you start, and it's basically, you're, with used, you can keep on reinvesting. And you get a good portion of your money back out of it. Not making a huge profit. It all depends. I mean, if you find a good deal on a bike and you're able to fix it up yourself, like I am, you can make a little bit of a profit on it. And uh, then you can start penny banking away. So when you can afford that more expensive bike, it's really wrapped to tighten back or shorter. All right. Uh, I'm going to think that one forward. There we go. So yeah, um, it is attainable, and that's why where a lot of the people are like, "How do you get to that level?" You know, it's like, well, that's a slow process, and uh, man, I really I made it. Yeah, that's what happened. It's either the tape is too short, which could be, but I highly doubt it. I got a little too. Uh, tighten my wrapping down here so I need to span it out a little more there we go get my extra roller to so yeah the history of cycling has changed quite a bit and you know doing this particular thing of refurbishing bikes to get people into road riding has provided me opportunity to play with a whole bunch of different bikes that I would never never would have sought out to get and uh, it's turned out to be a very very beneficial and satisfying thing to do for sure So that's where we're at. <laughs> Perfect. So almost got this guy wrapped up. Boom. There we go. Nice and clean. So the Attention to detail. Oh. It's always very special on these higher end old school bikes. You do a lot of extra work because they have some detail beyond and to give it justification you got to put that effort into it. So, there we go. Whoop. Roll that over. Alrighty. 
That's 2500 Pro Trek, early 90s, full Dur Ace. It's ready to go to a museum. So if you're a museum person, please contact me. <laughs> we got this guy and another titanium, which is really bizarre. Still trying to figure that one out. But anywho, back to this one, 2500. All cleaned up, cables are all new and housing. So to recap, what's really only different on this bike from the OEM, um, I think the bars are that uh, the same OEM. The stem's a little bit different as the origin, so, but it's very similar style. Um, I'm not really sure. I'll have to look up some, see if I can find the spec sheet. I did upgrade the car, as a carbon seat post on here versus the aluminum, but this saddle, the turbo, that's original. That's crazy. Uh, the Dura-Ace itself, the chain, or I'm mean, sorry, the derailleurs, the crank set, bottom bracket, headset, and hubs, those are all the original. Uh, the chain is not, that's been, that's a newer chain. I put that on there, but the older one was rusted, and the cassette is new. So the chain cassette and cables and housing and the stem and the seat post are the only things that are not OEM on this bike, which for this age, being over 30 years old, pretty darn good considering, well, bar tape and pedals, but we're nitpicking on that if you're going that crazy. But anywho, um, there we go. That's a wrap. Uh, if you found something like this, I think I found... One of the 2500 frames around 500 bucks or so if you find like i mean i might be pretty hard pressed to get the same durace vintage but you can get like the newer stuff or hey get the 800 dollars electric shifting that would be mind-blowing to see um <laughs> a 30 year old frame and fork on a component tree that's 2023 that'll be that'd be something anywho um yeah, a beautiful, they, the craftsmanship on these are, it's amazing, beautiful. The polished lugs, uh, aluminum fork, the, the machining of the Durace is just bountiful of beauty and tech and precision. And it's just one of those things that puts me back. It's like when you saw one of these in a shop new back in the day, it was like, wow, this is pretty cool stuff. So anywho. Well, check out the pictures of the final product and some highlighted features. Until next time, from the garage, have a wonderful day.